be like winding down with five minutes left. All right, you're live again. All right, welcome back, everybody. All of you watching out there, I hope you were able to get settled, uh, get, maybe get something to eat real quick. So we left off with topics for employee training. We looked at the different topics that OSHA standards and regulations require that the training include, which includes the Bloodborne Pathogen Standard um, literature on the standards for approaching biohazard, uh, uh, hepatitis B vaccine, um, the exposure control plan. Now we're going to look at um, training to be safe. Uh, in the workplace, the actual training that the employee will go through as a biohazard technician. Uh, the bloodborne pathogen standard infectious body fluids may be present, or bloodborne pathogens and infectious bodily fluids may be present. Take appropriate precautions. Complete uh, complete company safety training program for biohazard stand for bloodborne pathogens. Uh, be immunized with the vitamin the the hepatitis B vaccine, excuse me, vitamin, uh, be trained to wear appropriate PPE. Um, PPE training is something that is not just required, but very savvy because PPE can be used in the wrong way in so many different ways. And then complete requirements for wearing a respirator. This includes uh, both a fit test and a fit test physical fit test and then a mask fit test. Uh, you have to be able to breathe under a strenuous condition as well as have a respirator that fits you properly and seals around the mouth to make sure that everything's directed through the cartridges. So if we take a quick look here at, if I just put this down really quick, we can take a look at my respirator I bought. So this is a standard half-face respirator. Um, it has both sides here for cartridges, which filter the air that I breathe through. So when I talk about a fit test and a physical fit test, I'm talking about being able to work with this thing on my face, being able to bring my heart rate up. I have to be able to bring my heart rate up while wearing this mask um, and still be able to efficiently uh, work while maintaining with the mask on my face. Um, it can create claustrophobic, claustrophobic fears for some. Um, others uh, might not have a strong enough respiratory system to be able to perform work while wearing one of these. And an actual respirator fit test is a test performed to make sure that this respirator actually fits on my face properly. It has to create a seal all the way around my face to prevent any sort of uh, contaminated um, air through my respiratory system coming in through the sides. It all has to be directed through the cartridges. And if we take a look at a couple cartridges really quick, I'll just show you what these might look like. Now these are just really simple dust cartridges. Um, the only thing they're going to hold back from my lungs are sawdust and other small particle materials, um, but organic vapors aren't going to be held back by these. I'm still going to be able to smell any sort of bad smells um, and any sort of uh, infectious agent might still be able to make it through these cartridges, but this is uh, this is how a lot of um, this is how a lot of crawl spaces are addressed. It's just right here with the pink cartridges. I'll come around right there, and that's a half face respirator. With well, a half face respirator, one also needs to, if one of these is required, goggles are also required. And so an employee will want to be protecting their respiratory system while also protecting their eye orifices. And so that is good face protection on a biohazard scene right there. 
You can see here I've got organic vapor cartridges. These are more cartridges for the respirator. Um, these organic vapor cartridges do a lot more in terms of filtering contaminants that I'm breathing um, on, in a, on a scene. Um, and so these will, these cartridges will also effectively, um, in most cases, eliminate the smell. Um, sometimes that's the hardest thing to get through on a scene is, is uh, the putrid smell of some things. And, and a, an organic vapor cartridge uh, does, goes a long way to not just reducing the uh, actual contaminants, but the actual smell as well, making the work a little bit more tolerable. So that's respirator um, requirements there. You need to be able to make sure the respirator fits properly. Um, it can't just be you. Somebody has to be present. Another employee, um, preferably a manager, has to be present to actually visualize that the, the mask fits right. And um, in some cases, smoke is even used to make sure that the smoke will never get it, the smoke won't move around your mask and, and it'll make you choke if it's not fitting properly. Moving on to uh, uh, take appropriate precautions um, for both the scene that you're approaching, the scene that you're working on, um, the biohazardous situation, as well as for yourself. Um, we're talking about making sure others approaching the scene um, know what they're walking towards, uh, know the precautions that need to be taken, as well as you and your other employees on scene. Uh, personal protective equipment, warning labels and signs are a big one. Um, you could be doing some of the best work you've ever done, but if somebody walks behind you through a door that wasn't properly labeled that they shouldn't enter, um, there could be an exposure, there could be cross-contamination. So proper signs and warning labels do need to be posted in these types of situations. Emergency situations involving blood, um, employee, employees should be trained on that. Um, biohazards are not just scenes that we often go to clean. Biohazards can also be created um, on a job site with an injury. Um, injuries can lead to further exposure and so employees need to be trained on how to properly handle an emergency situation involving blood. Reporting an exposure incident, um, all exposure incidents need to be reported that happen on the job site. Um, not reporting it is not smart. Um, reporting uh, reporting um, a hazard or reporting an exposure um, protects you, protects the employer. Um, goes a lot further to um, protecting you than you might think in some cases as well. Um, so it always has to be reported. Um, and the post-exposure evaluation and follow-up, um, again, an employee should know uh, what they're going to have to go through um, and should be trained uh, should they face an exposure. Um, they should know that they're going to have to see a physician. They should know that their physician is going to provide the employer with some information about the, um, the result of that exposure. Um, the employee should know that he can request counseling um, should the employee want counseling after an exposure. Um, and so here we can see... Well, That's a good biohazard sign. Um, we'll post signs like this in extreme situations where only authorized personnel should enter. Um, and those authorized personnel are personnel that know what PPE to use, how to use that PPE, and what's going on at the job site. Training records. So this exposure control plan all the training records that are kept, the exposure determination, the standards, the method for, for implementation, the opinions of the healthcare professional, again the training, because training has to happen once a year at least, training happens 
all the time, if an employer can recognize that training has happened in an unconventional environment, if it's documented, it counts as training. But all these records need to be kept. We've discussed a lot about the standards and regulations that have to be adhered to, which involve creating these plans and keeping these records and training employees on what to expect and how to handle these situations. All these records need to be kept. Employers must provide records to the director of the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Um, the Assistant Secretary of Labor for the OSH for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and employees and, or, employees are employee representatives, which obviously representation such as lawyers or uh, medical representation. Um, records must be kept for three years, um, even post, even after the employee has left the business. So training that that employee has received needs to be backdated three years. Um, once three years has passed, that can fall off the end, but all these records need to be updated continually. Exposure control plans that, uh, that have new implementations need to be updated. Training that needs to happen at least once a year for each employee has to be documented and so these things are going to be next dated next dated so you've just kind of got a continuous record for a biohazard technician and the employer he works for training records include these training dates content or summary of the training name and qualifications of the trainer the trainee and the trainer um, the qualify conducting the training and the names and job titles of the employees attending that training. Um, here at ServPro of Salem, we do one quarterly training for all employees to attend. And these trainings do have different topics at different times, but they do address the standards and regulations that need to be adhered to. And that's done quarterly. Um, we have a great office administration that documents these trainings for us. Um, we've got a great bunch of heads here down here at SERPRO that provide the training in very effective ways, um, very knowledgeable ways. Um, and so that's how we here at SERPRO are able to, um, that's, how, that's how we adhere to these guidelines and rules. Um, medical record keeping requirements. Now, these are the written opinions from the healthcare professionals, uh, both prior to an exposure and after an exposure. An employer must keep confidential medical records for each employee with a potential for exposure. Now, like I said, he's got the potential for exposure and he's had a pre exposure doctor's evaluation. Um, He's healthy, um, doesn't currently have hepatitis B, hepatitis, uh, HIV, um, has received the vaccine, um, results of examinations, and these are, again, written opinions. They are not your medical record in its entirety in any way, but they are confidential and considered as such a medical record provided to your employer. So it is confidential and the employer must keep it confidential. Records must be kept confidential, of course. Records cannot be disclosed or reported to any person without an employee's express written consent. So situations like that might involve lawyers. Um, I need I need my healthcare professional's opinion to be seen by this particular person. Records must be maintained for the duration of the employee's employment plus 30 years. So we've got the continual training records and exposure plans and, and, and exposure determinations that are kept for three years on a continuous cycle. The medical records and medical health care opinions 
involved with these, whether post-exposure or pre-exposure, need to be kept for 30 years, including the duration of the employee's employment. So if I quit tomorrow, my job here at Servpro, Servpro needs to keep my records involving vaccinations, healthcare opinions, for at least 30 more years. And that's just what an employer has to go through to be able to provide this type of work, this, this, this value to a customer that may need it. Um, all that is set aside from actually finding an employee that is actually willing to do this type of work. Um, some think that they're willing to do it and find out they're less capable than they thought. Some don't know if they would be okay with doing it until they've tried. Um, and some just know flat out, I would never want to do that. I don't work at a hospital for a reason. <laughs> so now let's move on to the actual cleaning and disinfecting, disinfecting process. What our technicians will actually assess and, and perform on the job site when addressing a biohazard senior substance. Of course is to the first step of course is to prepare the work site. First we're going to evaluate all hazards. Um, obviously we've come to perform some sort of biohazard recovery or cleanup in this situation or in this topic uh, which does present that hazard but an evaluation and a plan needs to be created about are there any other hazards? How are those hazards going to be addressed? Um, post warning signs at the entrance for all work areas, need, that needs to be done. Um, biohazard, bloodborne pathogens, Kent Jones, 50C. So this is like something that would be posted outside <coughs> of a customer's residence. Um, to alert anybody who might be trying to make entry there or even just come and give condolences. Sometimes that happens, sometimes you can't prevent against it, but warning signs are the best way to work with that. Um, remove unsalvageable items. So after you've created the, the worksite evaluation, you've moved on to the worksite plan, now we're actually doing the work. We are removing the unsalvageable items. Um, these are all items obviously caked or soaked in blood or infectious material, um, non-porous, or I meant porous uh, items that soak the blood up or the infectious material. Um, these items cannot be restored. These items do have to be removed. They cannot very effectively be decontaminated and they are from then forward considered con uh, con regulated waste. And that waste needs to be disposed of properly. In the training that I received, um, I was trained by the ABRA, the American Biohazard Recovery <coughs> Association. And my instructor, he was quite a guy. Um, he was pretty good at getting his points across about how this work is done, the value it provides, and, and how to protect ourselves as the actual technicians, um, which is number one. Uh, as a technician, as the on-site guy myself, my number one concern is, is protecting myself and those around me. And so in his description, in his short word of description, he says bi biohazard, is, biohazard uh, recovery is very simple um, if you know how to uh, evaluate and perform four key things. Pick it up, soak it up, cut it out, and throw it away. Now these are very broad and general terms used for a very not broad and very specific situation. Um, but if you know how to perform these specific broad terms um, as it pertains to biohazard cleanup. So if you are presented with a scene that does create a biohazard to you, um, we're looking at 
you know, there's, there's, there's multiple things affected, um, lots of material, um, and it can kind of be daunting. How do I even begin to start this task of cleanup? Um, I have my PPE, um, we have work practice controls, we have engineering controls, um, I'm ready to go to work. But how do I start? Where do I start? You start by picking it up. Now just by saying that, of course you can't just go start picking it up without knowing how to do that properly. And we've, we've touched on that subject by using mechanical means to pick things up that could possibly puncture your PPE. Um, we've talked about in other ways uh, using gloves. Make sure to protect skin, protect yourself from contact with the material. And just the term itself, pick it up. There is a mode of transportation in this type of cleanup that dictates that you should remove the solid items first. If you've got bits and pieces, if you've got chunks, um, physical stuff or saturated things, they should be removed first. We're going to pick these things up. If I can't safely pick it up as a contaminated item with my hand, I need to find a different way to pick it up. And it needs to be transferred into a puncture-proof, leak-proof container. So we've picked it all up. Now, next step is to soak it up. So in some cases, um, and not all cases, this applies. But in the cases that this does apply, we're dealing with pooling. Pooling of blood, pooling of infectious material, of body fluids. Um, it, uh, it's not crusted or coagulated yet. It, it's a pool of liquid. And so now we have to soak that up. We can't continue to pick the pool of liquid up. We have to soak that up. And so there's plenty of means of doing that. Um, like I said, if you know how to pl apply these simple uh, terms to a biohazard cleanup scene, then you know that it's a lot more entailed. Um, blood or infectious material can be soaked up um, using cloth that is never going to be used again, cloth that will become regulated waste. Um, it can be soaked up using absorbent, um, sort of like kitty litter, if you will, um, can be spread on a pool and it'll soak that up and then the the absorbent itself or the kitty litter type substance uh, becomes the regulated waste. And that those are the types, those are the ways that you can soak it up, the second step. And so now we've done that. We've picked up all the chunks, we've soaked up all the blood. Where do we move next? All the all the, the, the absorbent that we used to, to soak up the blood that, that turned into regulated waste and we were able to get that into into the regulated waste containers. Now we're on to cut it out. And so with and this applies to a lot of the scenes that you might find yourself presented with, um, but in the case of a mattress, um, the mattress has a smaller amount of blood on it. It does not contaminate the entire mattress. Um, the entire mattress is contaminated because you can't necessarily replace that one spot that has the blood in it, and you can't continue to use it because it is uh, possibly an infectious material. So, in this case, we have a mattress, and it's got some blood on it, but it's not all the mattress. And if you think about it, it'd be pretty hard to find a leak-proof, puncture-proof container to put the entire mattress in. So what are we going to do? We're just going to cut out the affected material. The entire mattress is affected, but we are just going to cut out the actual physical infection of the blood, of the contaminated material. Um, so there might be a section of this big of a mattress that we cut out. There might be a section this big of, of subfloor that we end up cutting out. Um, that's because the material itself can't necessarily fit into 
regulated waste containers, so we have to reduce its size, and we're not going to reduce its size on, an, on, on the entire subfloor scale, but we're just going to remove the contaminated area. And of course, the last step, as I described, was uh, pick it up, soak it up, cut it out, throw it away. The last step is throw it away. Well, that we're, we're pertaining to regulated waste here. And so throwing it away does not just mean take it to the curb. Throwing it away means that these materials are in a puncture-proof, leak-resistant container. Um, the state of Oregon regulates how regulated waste is both transported and disposed, and so we need to adhere to those regulations and guidelines. Um, so it's not just as simple as throw it away, but when applied to a biohazard situation, pick it up, soak it up, cut it out, throw it away, helps me a lot in determining the plan on how to move forward with these types of situations. Porous materials. Porous materials cannot be restored when, when they have come into contact with infectious material. They have to be removed or disposed of. Fabrics, carpet rugs, mattresses, pillows, furniture cushions, all these things are either going to get completely discarded or cut up and then completely discarded. There's no way we could restore a couch that had come into contact with infectious material. It's, it's porous material, it's, it's cushion and it's, it's fabric. Um, we could clean the heck out of it, but it never really produces the, the peace of mind and it also never really eliminates the risk of exposure. Preparing materials for disposal. These are porous materials still. Remove the excess contamination. Excise the contaminated sections. Cut it out. Remove was pick it up. Excise is cut it out. Decontaminate excise sections. We do use EPA registered disinfectants. Um, Benefact is just an example here that I have. Uh, this product is Benefact uh, disinfectant. Disinfectants such as that are applied both to contaminated materials that are regulated waste and to non-contaminated materials that were in the vicinity of potentially infectious material. Um, so we want to leave the scene um, definitely decontaminated, and so EPA-registered disinfectants are how we do that. These disinfectants are applied to contaminated material and regulated waste simply to reduce the risk both during both to the employee and during transportation that an exposure happens. Um, an exposure may still happen, but maybe because a disinfectant was implied, the result was better than it could have been. And so disinfectants are applied to both the contaminated material um, and surrounding materials as well. Non-porous materials. Non-porous materials can be restored from infectious materials in most cases. Uh, clean and dis disinfect materials, hard surfaces um, such as hard flooring, different types of surfaces you find in your home, such as countertops. Um, these, these types of surfaces can be restored uh, after they've come in contact with potentially infectious material. Um, thoroughly wet, pre-cleaned surface with disinfectant. And that's right, I've said it once before in this presentation, you can't disinfect without, priorly, without first cleaning. Um, and so, Yes, after we're done cleaning a non-porous surface, we will liberally disinfect it. Um, this goes to reducing the risk of an exposure, reducing the risk of the, the potentially infectious substance, and 
to, to work towards that peace of mind after something like this has happened um, on your non-course material. So how does pick it up, soak it up, cut it out, throw it away apply to a non-porous material such as a countertop? Well, we're still going to pick it up. If there's chunks and pieces or contaminated material, we're going to pick that up and then we're going to soak it up. Whether we can soak it up with fabric, that is going to be determined contaminated material, regulated waste, or we have to use something larger scale like um, absorbent, then we're not going to cut it out. In, a non, in, the, in the case of a non-porous material, we don't have to cut it out. Um, unless for some reason there's some way that that infectious material is unable to be excised just by cleaning materials and disinfecting. Restoring hard, non-porous materials, remove the excess contamination, clean the affected areas with an appropriate cleaning product, and then disinfect with an EPA-registered disinfectant. So here we have a Surpro product, uh, 353. This is a wall rinse. Um, something like this would be used to clean contaminated material off of flat, or excuse me, a gloss painted wall. Um, if you're familiar with paint at all, the difference between gloss paint and flat paint can be all the difference in whether that wall can be cleaned or not. And so with non-porous surfaces, uh, first you do have to clean, and then you can disinfect. It does no good to disinfect as an effort to clean and disinfect in one step. That does, that does no good. You have to clean prior to disinfecting. I think we saw this picture in a previous slide already. Um, it's just sort of an illustration of how a biohazard technician might address um, small amounts of infectious material, potentially infectious material, on a hard surface. Now these, um, these floor tiles, these laminate floor tiles are considered a non-porous material even though we've got seams which can often create bound liquid within these, but uh, that's why you have to evaluate each scene that you approach in its own way, because each scene is going to be unique in its own way. And as we know, liquids can find themselves in all sorts of different spots. And as the restoration vendor, it is our job to identify and find the places, all the places that this either liquid or potentially infectious material have gone. And so in this picture, can any of you at home watching right now tell me if this biohazard technician, all that we can see of him is using his PPE properly? I'm looking at it and I think, yeah, he's, he's, he's got uh, gloves. Um, that are taped to his suit to reduce any sort of uh, liquid uh, seeping through the cuffs of his hands, the cuffs of his wrists. Um, his, we can see kind of in the back there that his suit extends all the way down to his legs. He's protecting his footwear and everything, and I'm sure he's using a proper respirator if we had a full picture of him too. So yes, it, as, for what we can see from from the picture, he is using his, his personal protective equipment properly. Um, he's not handling any sort of sharp object or needle, um, so he doesn't need uh, to use any more than gloves to address the liquid that he's there addressing. Decontamination of equipment, that's a big one. Um, a big one that applies to us as a vendor mainly only. Um, we are able to do this type of work because we adhere to these, these regulations and these guidelines. Um, but one of the biggest oversights is taking, your, taking the things you need to perform your job to 
a contaminated work site and then bringing them back to the, the point of operation. Um, that obviously happens, but knowing that this equipment needs to be decontaminated every time it's used in the scene on a scene that has potentially infectious material needs to be decontaminated. An oversight of that could create an exposure, a little known exposure, uh, an exposure that's not quite known as an exposure. This a piece of equipment was on scene of a biohazard recovery and it was not properly disinfected and if that piece of equipment ever injures another employee there could be a real issue there being that it could be an exposure. So cleaning and decontaminate all equipment used for the project. Wipe off equipment surface with an EPA registered disinfectant. We've got our benefact over here so I'm going to wipe down everything I've used that I cannot throw away. Most everything I used on the job site to handle a regulated or a, uh, a potentially infectious material uh, is going to end up being regulated waste. My suit, my PPE suit that I use to cover my whole body and my shoes. I'm not going to try and wash that and reuse it. That suit becomes regulated waste with the rest of what I recovered. Um, my gloves, likely going to become regulated waste. My respirator, if I'm on scene where I need to use a respirator, it's often that this is not regulated waste. It's often that I can keep my face and my respirator and my goggles out of the contaminated substance. And even if it does come into contact with the contaminated substance, I wouldn't go straight away to throw my regulator away. My regulator here, minus these cartridges, which are very porous, is a non-porous surface. My regulator is made of non-porous rubber and can be completely sanitized, broken down even into multiple parts and completely sanitized and disinfected um, should it ever need. Um, a respirator is uh, most often sanitized and disinfected after every use. Um, that's just proper handling. Uh, but should it ever come into contact with uh, potentially infectious material, I'm still able to clean this um, to a point where it is decontaminated. And I can use it again. Just like the equipment. This is considered the equipment that we're talking about. And so it has to be decontaminated every time. It's key. Otherwise, you're just putting yourself at risk. You're putting your friends and employees at risk. Your coworkers at risk. Um, and so, and if, like I said, it's one of the high, most highly oversought uh, steps of the job site process is um, after this work has been completed and we're ready to leave the job site, there's still that one more step. Everything needs to be decontaminated, um, whether here on scene or if we can make a transport and decontaminate elsewhere. Um, the more you can do on scene, though, the better, uh, because that reduces the risk of cross-contamination. So that was a pretty good coverage of how the employee is to perform the work. We've looked at the different types of procedures. We've looked at how a scene can be addressed to create that plan. Um, if you just can keep it in the back of your head, you pick it up, you soak it up, you cut it out, you throw it away. These are the generals that will help you develop a plan to properly address a potentially infectious subject. So now let's look at preparing the cleaners. We, we've looked at how to actually perform the work, but there is some steps that need to be taken to actually prepare this technician for what he might encounter. A trauma and death scene cleanup. Um, and it is a touchy subject that not all employees are aware of whether or not this type of work is something they're able to do or not. Um, of course, it involves most often off the top of your head, is, is my stomach strong enough to handle a smell that bad or a visual scene that bad? Um, and sometimes 
an individual just doesn't know until they've encountered something like that. Death scene cleanup involves psychological issues. Customers may be undergoing emotionally traumatic situations. And so not only does the employee have to be able to handle this scene themselves, um, they have to have the wherewithal to be able to handle outside emotion from either customers, other people on scene. As I described earlier, I was on a biohazard scene, and, and what stuck out to me the most was the congregation of a church that this individual had belonged to showed up almost in its entirety, and um, the crying was, was very loud and very well heard. And that was just the one thing that uh, psychologically stuck in my head throughout that. And so being able to perform my task at hand as well as be sympathetic to what has happened and sympathetic to these people outside um, and even handling an on-scene customer who may have some questions um, is one of the most is one of the key aspects of a good biohazard technician. Uh, the technician needs to have a strong stomach to deal with dead body and odors. Uh, the type of deodorization and cleanup can be difficult but also rewarding. Um, I say this a lot about the services we provide at SurfPro. There's not many people that call us with a smile on their face. Um, but it's, it's, it's I feel a lot of pride in, in working for this company because there's not many people that use our services that don't end up with a smile on their face. You know, we, we get them with, we get the customers that are distraught and, and upset, something has interrupted their lives, whether it be here because of a biohazard scene or because of water damage or fire damage or some of the other services we provide, something's gone wrong we're here to make it right. And that technician, being able to portray that to a customer, that everything will be okay, or not even that, just be empathetic in some cases, um, can be hard to find an employee. And also, very good to have. Customers facing emotional time, family of a victim, they face sudden saddened by the loss of their family member think about the gruesome the, they're thinking about exactly what happened um, often we as the the cleanup vendor are not the first person to see the scene um, often first responders personnel family neighbors are first to see these types of scenes and so people can end up with that ingrained in their mind um, and have something to say about it while we're there as well so expressing tact in these situations is more desirable than not. Confronted by remains, interacting with authorities and representative or responders, there's very very key subject there. Often that often we have to both interact with a customer and a first responder in these types of situations. And aside from the work that needs to be done, that itself can be overwhelming. And uncomfortable about living in the home until the scene is cleaned. And of course, that's where we try and pride ourselves as being able to turn that frown upside down. Um, there's not much you can tell somebody to make them think differently about what they think about something. But if you can do your work in a professional manner and be empathetic to what has happened, people might end up okay with what they've gone through. And that's what we want to do. And be good listeners, but not a counseling service. Because we are definitely not that. We are not there to counsel um, anyone who might be having a good time. And even attempting to do that in even a minor way can go wrong. Um, you do not want to try and direct or give advice very much advice to somebody who's going through something is something like this, something that is traumatic. Um, it can it can aggravate people um, on accident. Um, it can create 
distrust in ways on accident. Um, just erring on the side of caution for biohazard technicians to just be empathetic um, and listen. Listen, it, listening is, is key. Um, obviously, listening to a customer who is very distraught about a traumatic scene or a traumatic situation that has happened, you're gonna have to take some time in some cases to not do that work just yet, but let's, let's, let's listen to this customer and let her or him get, get what's off their chest because I can tell that that's what needs to happen right now. Um, and so we kind of sometimes have to put that aside, whether it's before or after. Um, this customer needs my attention right now. So exercise discretion and tact. Oh, oh, excuse me. Slide malfunction. Exercising discretion and tact is what I'm talking about in these situations. Undergoing an emotional experience is hard for some people. And saying the wrong thing is the last thing you want to do. Be discreet when taking pictures of a trauma scene. That's a huge one that can just set people off is the way you're taking pictures, the type of pictures you're taking, the smile on your face while you're taking pictures. Any, any small detail can turn a trauma scene into a headache real quick. And you have to be prepared mentally. Like I've said prior a couple times in this presentation, a biohazard technician who works for a restoration company or any employee that works for a restoration company or any company cannot be forced to do biohazard cleanup. If it's a potentially infectious substance, which any blood is under universal precautions or any body fluid even under universal precautions, that employee has to make the determination whether or not he's willing to do the work. He cannot be fired for not willing to do the work. He can't be punished for not being willing to do the work. And he can make this determination anytime. Before he's sent to a job, while he's at a job, figuring it out for himself, or after. He says, hey, I went, I did that for you guys. I'm never willing to do it again. An employer has to abide by this. Must biohazard cleaners be certified? And here is the trick about that. So we've kind of walked through a lot of OSHA and a little bit of EPA, but here we go with OSHA and EPA do not regulate the cleanup of mold. Environmental, the EPA releases guidelines for mold, as we might have learned in our uh, mold remediation class, if any, any of you has ever attended that. Um, the Occupational Safety and Healthy Administration, OSHA, releases Safety and Health Administration on a bulletin. Uh, this is involving mold in the workplace. Asbestos cleanup, um, EPA, OSHA and EPA require appropriate training for asbestos cleanup. Asbestos training must be accredited, accredited, so you can't just be trained, but your training also has to be accredited and certified. Um, and the EPA's model for accreditation plan is the Code of Federal Regulations 40 CFR those are the guidelines set forth about asbestos abatement um, from the EPA, the training guidelines. The asbestos cleanup accreditation component, uh, competent persons completing training meet the criteria of the model accreditation plan. Uh, defined by OSHA Asbestos Standard for Construction Industry 1926.1101. Um, if you guys need any further references, that is a good reference, the OSHA Abatement Standard. Um, but asbestos isn't our topic of subject today. Comparing the requirements, that's what these two slides have been leading to here. We've, we've looked at mold real briefly and the, and the, the regulated requirements for that, asbestos and the regulated requirements for that. So in comparison, mold cleanup, no OSHA standards or EPA regulations. EPA OSHA offer guidelines for mold cleanup and recommendations. 
biohazard cleanup, OSHA has a standard, training is required, but accreditation is not. So I was trained by the ABRA, which is an accredited training program, but I do not need to have that to go and clean a biohazard scene. Um, I'm grateful to my employer that provided me with the training, the accreditation training involving biohazard cleanup. But asbestos, asbestos cleanup, OSHA standards and EPA regulations, training and accreditation required. And we might be able to guess why asbestos is a little bit more largely regulated but I would like to pose a final question for our class today. How come, not how come, but asbestos containing material is not regulated waste. Mold containing material is not regulated waste. Biohazard containing material, potentially infectious material, is regulated waste. And can anybody think why that is? I have, to, I have to send my potentially infectious material to a very certain place for disposal versus the asbestos and the mold can go to the junkyard. Do you know why that is? <coughs> the potentially infectious diseases involved with biohazard the potentially infectious viruses involved with that continue throughout its transport, throughout its life, throughout its disposal. Asbestos and mold, excuse me, mold is an organic material. Uh, mold spores are all around us all the time, um, and mold itself is organic. Nobody in the history of mankind is ever going to eliminate mold from this planet. So regulating its waste is kind of a waste of time. Throw it away, mold grows everywhere, keep it out of your house. Asbestos, asbestos containing materials, asbestos is a mineral, a natural mineral here on earth. Um, it's actually an element found on the periodic table of elements. Asbestos being that it is a natural mineral in our earth, um, kind of lines it out for not being a regulated waste product. Whereas biohazard cleanup, potentially infectious materials, they need to be regulated. The transport cannot be overlooked because an exposure could happen. An exposure of potentially infectious material could happen all the way to the disposal site, um, which here in Marion County is a trash burner. Um, there's a facility that burns a lot of Marion County's trash and per ordinance, uh, regulated waste, potentially infectious material, must be incinerated. And that's how regulated waste is taken care of here in the valley for us. And that's why asbestos um, exposure during a job site um, is highly regulated. Biohazard exposure on a job site, highly regulated. Mold exposure, pretty regulated. But the disposal of these different things is where the differences come in and the standards for training. And so this slide has a prompt for any questions that any of you might have at home. You guys feel free to post on Facebook. If, uh, if any of you have any questions, you can ask ServPro Salem West directly. We'll get right back to you. Um, I'd like to thank my guests here with me for being here. I'd like to thank all of you out there for watching with me today. Uh, it was a pretty fun class. I hope somebody, I hope all of you learned something, and I hope to see you guys next time. Uh, besides that, have a great day. Call us if you need us. <laughs>